Greetings. Today is Sunday, the 10th of November of 2024. This service was pre-recorded on Friday the 8th. Participants are reader and video photographer Shane Donnelly and myself. If you are in the area next Saturday, the 16th, the congregation is going to host me to a birthday party following the Saturday service. And I will be 75 years of age on the 19th. Thank you for joining us. You have a good day and we'll Hopefully, see you next weekend. couple weeks it's going to be our national holiday of thanksgiving and there's snoopy and he's getting excited he's looking forward to thanksgiving too now i have had children's sermons about the charlie brown thanksgiving but this is a new one and i know that i've not repeated charles Scholes, who was the cartoonist of Peanuts, was a Methodist minister, a licensed pastor, not an ordained pastor, and he used his comics and his TV programs to bring Bible truth and to remind us of the teachings of Jesus. And of course, his first animation on national TV was A Charlie Brown Christmas, where the Peanuts gang Learn the real reason why we celebrate Christmas. And then his next cartoon was It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Sometimes people don't pick up the lesson. Lioness, who was so knowledgeable about the Bible, and he was quoting the Bible different times, he, he got a little bit off base. And he was the only person who believed in the great pumpkin and he missed trick-or-treating and the parties and and everything and he stayed up all night waiting for the great pumpkin and you know what he was wrong and sometimes people who who love God and read the Bible they can make mistakes like lioness did but right now we're going to look at a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving and what is the story well the Peanuts gang, fine, it's a very nice day. And Charlie Brown, as before, wants to play some football. And what happens? Friend Lucy, she holds the football 
and he's going to kick it, and then she pulls it, and he falls down. Now, she's done that before. She's done it many times, and he was hoping this time it, things would be different, but it didn't happen. But you know what? He forgave her. And then Peppermint Patty, she has nowhere to go for Thanksgiving dinner, and she asked Charlie Brown if he would host everybody to dinner. And again, the weather was nice and they could go outside, but Charlie Brown doesn't know how to cook or bake. So Snoopy and Lioness helped him, and they came up with a Thanksgiving dinner. What a Thanksgiving dinner. Jelly beans. And they had toast and pretzels and popcorn. And they all gathered at the table. And Lioness had a prayer and, and reminded them that they, they all needed to be thankful. But you know what? Peppermint Patty, she wasn't very happy. She said, I want to know where's the turkey? What kind of a Thanksgiving dinner do we have here? But Marcy told her, don't hurt the feelings of Charlie Brown. When everybody comes together as family and friends, they need to forgive one another. And we need to appreciate Thanksgiving just isn't about eating. It's about being with other people that we care about. Then Charlie Brown remembered at four o'clock, he was to go to his grandmother's for a big turkey dinner. And he was going to be late. And he called his grandmother and she said, you know what? Why don't you bring all your friends to my home? We'll find a place for them at the table. And as they went, they sang the Thanksgiving song over the river and through the woods. The grandmother's house we go. And Charlie said, you know what? My grandmother doesn't live on a farm. She lives in a condominium. But wherever you have your home, you can be grateful. And what happens at the end? Snoopy and Woodstock, they go to a doghouse. And they have a Thanksgiving dinner and pumpkin pie. All right, so whether we live in a doghouse, a condominium, or Charlie Brown's home, be thankful, be contented with what God has given us. That, that is part of the lesson of the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. And we have on our bulletin cover the words from the Bible, in everything give thanks, for this the will of God. And that's, that's what I'm going to ask you. Think about what has happened in your life in the past year. You may not have everything that you want. You may not have been able to do things that you wanted to do, and things haven't always gone to your satisfaction. But be thankful. You have people who love you. You have a place to stay. God is providing for you, and we need to be thankful. Be thankful for what God has done for us. And what I'm giving you as your gift this weekend, what about some pretzels? Have a happy Thanksgiving. The word of God is found in the book of 1 Samuel. This is coming from chapter 2, verses 12 through 19, 22 through 30, uh, 34 and 35. I'm reading from the New International Version Bible. The boy Samuel. The priest Eli and his wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests with the people that whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, and while the meat was being boiled, a servant of the priest would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would plunge it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself whatever the fork brought up. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the servant of the priest would come and say, The man who was sacrificing, give the priest some meat 
to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the man said to him, Let the fat be burned up first, and then take whatever you want, the servant would then answer, No, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing the linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, it is not good a good report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people. If a man sins against another man, God may mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your father's house when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your father out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go to my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your father's house all the offerings made with fire by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offerings that I prescribe for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourself on the choice parts of every offering made by the people of Israel? Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and your father's house would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me. Those who dishonor me, I will, those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. And what happens to your sons Hophni and Phineas will be a sign to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his house, and he will minister before my anointed ones always. This is the word of the Lord. John Hancock, the first signature on the Declaration of Independence. Presidents Chester Arthur, Grover Cleveland, and Woodrow Wilson, Aretha Franklin, Queen of Soul Music, Kitty Hawk, Aviators, Orville, and Wilbur Wright, film star Denzel Washington. All these famous men and women share one thing in common. They are PKs, preacher's kids, sons and daughters of religious professionals. If I did a printout of well-known people raised in a parsonage, I could wallpaper the front of this room. Historically, the offspring of clergy have been stereotyped as uncontrollable brats, sowers of wild oats, nonconformists, baptized heathen, and hellraisers. Rock and roller Alice Cooper, known to spit fake blood, dismember baby dolls and stab them with a sword, and dance with a snake, is the son of a Methodist pastor. The notorious bank and train robbers of the Wild Wild West, brothers Jimmy and Jesse James, were the sons of a Baptist pulpiteer. And the proponent of the theory of evolution, advancing the idea that we are the descendants of King Kong and Cheetah, Charles Darwin, his dad was a vicar in the Church of England. The manse, that's what Presbyterians call the home of the minister, has been the breeding ground 
for both bane and blessing to church world. First Samuel supplies us with a dark story of a family in top religious leadership who brought disrepute on the name of God. At the same time, corruption, sacrilege, and immorality were running rampant in the Old Testament church. The God of Israel was at work behind the scenes, grooming a little boy, Samuel, in the backslidden institution to be his spokesman and to serve as a national chaplain, anointing King Saul and David. If you have ever visited the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, there is a room with large professional boxer punching bags hanging from the ceiling with the face of Christ on them. Andy Warhol, a devout Byzantine Catholic, entitled his work Christ, the Punching Bag of the World. With every report of a priest guilty of child abuse, a minister having an illicit affair, or a TV preacher dipping his hand into the offering plate, Jesus Christ gets a black eye. Few of us inside the institution will deal with the issue. And among the factors explaining the erosion of organized religion is that the society has had enough of hypocrisy, deceit, and degeneracy going on behind the stained glass windows. Here is the relevancy of the Bible. Today's scripture lesson from 1 Samuel echoes today's headlines. When the church is in a mess and unable or unwilling to get his house in order to bring the nation unto Christ, the Lord may intervene and administer corrective measures and raise up a replacement to continue his work. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob set aside the tribe of Levi to serve as the priesthood. And from Levi, one family were selected as the high priest and the hierarchy, Aaron, brother of Moses. Aaron had four sons. Eleazar was the grandfather of Eli. Eli, in his lineage, would be snuffed out, with the high priesthood passed to the dynasty of Aaron's son, Ithamar. The Israelites had entered the promised land. The portable worship center called the Tabernacle was stationed at Shiloh. From every direction, the Israelites traveled to the shrine. As a payment to the priest, supervising the ritual sacrifice and acting as a butcher for the animal offering, there were prescribed portions of the cooked sheep, goat, or cow. Hophni and Phineas brothers, sons of the high priest Eli, fished through the boiling waters and helped themselves the round steak, rump roast, and filet mignon. Next, these guys demanded that they be paid in advance and cut off the raw meat they desired, like choice cuts of sirloin, T-bone, and porterhouse. If the worshiper resisted their insistence, they encountered bullying or assault. Hophni and Phineas took the raw meat and sold it on the marketplace to line their pockets. When the women showed up to assist with the cleansing of the tabernacle, the two priests pressured the gals to sleep with them. This promiscuity was going on in the house of God. With the disregard of the stipulations covering sacrifice, these shysters found a way to enrich themselves, plus the hanky-panky taking place on holy ground the Israelites would stay away. With Eli hearing the reports of the evil doing, having a powwow with Hophni and Phineas, Big Daddy confronted his boys about their misdoings. With a mild rebuke, the high priest told his sons that what they were doing 
was not okay. But he failed to get them the promise to cease the wrongdoing and announce if they kept it up, they would have to answer to the Lord. With Eli's counsel going in one ear and out the other, Hophni and Phinehas persisted in their abuse and misuse of the Lord's offerings and fornication. The Lord God dispatched an unidentified prophet to speak a word of doom. The man of God declared that the crown of high priest would be removed from Eli and transferred to the family tree of his great uncle. Call in the backhoe, for both of your sons will die on the same day. Not read in the next chapter, during a battle with the Philistines, the Ark of the Covenant, made famous by the movie of Indiana Jones, was confiscated by the enemy. Both Hophni and Phinehas were killed in the conflict. A messenger reported these happenings to Eli. Seated on a chair, the impact of the shock caused him to fall backward, hitting his head, breaking his neck, and instantly dying. Phineas's unnamed wife, an expectant mother, was so overwhelmed by the sequence of events, she went into a premature labor, dying from delivery. The last thing this mother did while she still had breath was to assign a name to the newborn, Ichabod. The glory has departed from Israel. What is the word of God teaching us in this unusual story? Number one. Christians need to be vigilant of those who exercise ecclesiastical leadership and hold them accountable for their teachings and witness. Pope John the Twenty-Third described the pontiff as the servant of the servants of God, the bishops as the servants of the servants of the servants of God, the priesthood as the servants of the servants of the servants of the servants of God, and the laity, people with a servant problem. Holy Writ recognizes five kinds of authority, divine, civil government, church, occupational, and parental. Leadership, elected or appointed, is to maintain law and order in a nation, the congregation, at the workplace, and in the home. Also, authority is to foster an environment promoting virtue, fine performance, and pride in our task. Eli was not responsible for the sins of his sons, but he was responsible to see that Hophni and Phinehas carried out their ordained job description with integrity. 1 Samuel 2.12 reads, Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. The Tanakh, or the Jewish Bible renders, now Eli's sons were scoundrels. They paid no heed to the Lord. The people of God are often gullible and lack a discernment, unable to detect derelict and destructive ministers in our midst. A Jewish rabbi, a Hindu guru, and an Elmer Gantry Razamitaz tele-evangelist traveled together to attend a Congress on World Religion. Late at night, the car broke down in the country. Walking to the farmhouse, they requested if they could be put up for the night. The farmer said that he had one spare room with two beds. One of the three would have to sleep in the barn. The rabbi agreed to go to the barn. Ten minutes later, there was a knock on the door. It was the rabbi. He could not remain in the barn because there was a pig, an unclean animal. So the Hindu Swami said he would sleep in the barn. And ten minutes later... There was a knock on the door, and the Hindu said that there was a cow, 
and in India, cattle are sacred. He was disallowed being under the same roof. The tele-evangelist went to the barn. Ten minutes later, there was a knock on the door. It was the pig and the cow. They did not want to be in the same room with this creep. Did not the grand teacher warn us to be continuously on the watch for false prophets and teachers, wolves in sheep's clothing, coming in our midst to steal, kill, and destroy? The apostles, Peter, Paul, James, and John, stress that greater harm comes to a community of faith not from the outside, but from within. And if leadership fails to take the necessary steps to put things right, the Lord may intervene as he did with Eli and his sons. No individual, group, denomination, organization, or nation is exempt from divine discipline. Number two, be on the lookout for ministers who have no calling and if they had one, have lost it. Does a servant of God display godliness or godlessness? At the ordination of Hophni and Phinehas, droplets of blood from a dove were mixed with olive oil and smeared on the lobe of the right ear, the thumb of the right hand, and the big toe on the right foot. And with this anointing of the Holy Spirit, the priest was consecrated to hear from the Lord. His hands were dedicated to work for the Lord, and his feet were yielded walking with the Lord. This ceremony meant nothing to these two men. The priest was to pursue a course in life, 24-7, that whether at the tabernacle or outside its precinct, he was to be aware of the presence of God in his life. A man was going to poach sheep from a pasture of his neighbor, and he put his son on the fence post to be a watchman. Is anyone coming from the north? No. From the south? No. From the east? No. From the west? No. Okay then I can go ahead and take some sheep. No, Daddy, there is one direction we forgot to look. What direction is that? We forgot to look up. Do we live with a God consciousness? Character has been described as who you are when no one is watching. And perhaps Christian credibility is determined by our thoughts, words, and deeds when we are alone with God? Do we seek to bring all areas of our existence into conformity with godly and righteous standards? During Operation Desert Storm, Bette Midler climbed to the top of the hit parade with God is watching us from a distance, and a guest vocalist refused to sing it. Her reckoning? God is not way out there, observing me from afar. He is down here, present, ever with me, with a full assurance of what I'm up to. Good answer. Your pastor does not have an untarnished halo, neither am I a candidate before death for the canonization to the priesthood. But I contend that I endeavor to bring my ministry and personal life under the authority of the scriptures and Christian tradition, and that it pleases the Lord to know that I want to please him. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Sr., father of the civil rights leader, declared, I am not what I should be, I am not what I want to be, and I am not what the Lord wants me to be. But thank God, I am not what I once was. As a pilgrim on the spiritual journey, are we making any progress? Is God 
at work in our lives. President Jimmy Carter has shared that a turning point in his life was a sermon he heard. If you were tried for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And taking inventory, Jimmy Carter said that if he answered with honesty, the answer was no. The winner of four Academy Awards, including Movie of the Year, was the 1981 Chariots of Fire, based on a story of a Scottish missionary, Eric Lytle, who would not race on a Sunday in the 1924 Summer Olympics. At the last minute, another contestant switched days with him, enabling Lytle's participation. Poised on the starting line and ready to take off. From out of the crowd, a man walked over to Lytle and handed him a scrap of paper. It was a Bible verse. 1 Samuel 2.30 For them that honor me, I will honor. That day, Eric Lytle broke the world record, meriting a gold medal. The prophet issued a stinging reprimand to Eli. You sought to please your sons more than you sought to please the Lord. As we enter the Thanksgiving season, guaranteed to be sung in our worship is Andre Crouch's My Tribute. Just let me live my life, let it be pleasing, Lord, to thee. Is this our cry, and is this the aspiration of our heart and soul. Third and last, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Hophni and Phineas used their favored spiritual status to indulge in material gain and immorality. The Lord God is patient and slow to anger with our transgressions. But when we exhaust his tolerance, do not repent and forsake our wicked ways, he brings judgment. The agent of God's wrath on Hophni and Phinehas was the enemy army of the Philistines. The Lord has an arsenal of weapons, government officials, media investigators, and even our adversaries. Every day I consult a website reporting scandals going on in churches across the country. And some of the biggest names on the church scene have been found engaging in criminal behaviors, fraud, scams, and affairs. This is disheartening. Warren Wearsby, radio teacher of Back to the Bible, was right with his evaluation of the four pitfalls of ministry, alliterated by an S, silver, sex, sloth, and self. And these landmines seem to be exploding all over the landscape. The ancient church formulated the evangelical councils to combat the seductions of wealth, immorality, and rejection of authority. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. Finding ourselves in a society of conspicuous consumerism and continual preoccupation with sex and the breakdown of governance at all levels, it is very difficult to live out the Christian life. And this is also true of church leadership. Hophni and Phineas stand accused of caving in the silver sex and self and persisting in this deplorable state and the power that authority was not used to implement change, God had the clean house. And to the credit of Eli, the high priest, no harm was brought to the youth working at the tabernacle as a full-time acolyte. Samuel. Every year his mother 
gifted him with a larger size white robe as his vesture. When worshippers came to Shiloh, on their itinerary was a visit to this boy, emerging into young manhood. He was a delight to be with, Mr. Personality, who was sold out in his devotion to the Lord. When events appear to be dismal and bad reports are the new norm, this episode reminds us that God is at work in ways that we cannot always apprehend. Two of the 39 books of the Old Testament are named for Samuel. He not only lighted the candles in the tabernacle, he shined in an age of darkness, used by the Lord to bring revival to the land. Let us never despair, and let us entrust ourselves to the move of God, anticipating what he is about to do. In the name of of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Now 